Nuclear decay! Hey, did you notice I didn't start my video by saying okay this time? How about that? Turns out there are several types of radioactive decay. The most common are gamma, beta, and alpha, and we're going to talk about those. Um, you also get something called neutron emission, which is just basically spitting out a neutron, and you can get spontaneous fission where your nucleus splits in half and spits out some neutrons and such. Um, we don't usually talk about neutron emission and spontaneous fission as much. They're not as, you know, they're not the part of the big three. And I think that's mainly, not being a nuclear scientist, I think that's mainly because these tend to happen fairly quickly. You don't tend to dig up some radioactive stuff from the ground and have these things happening. Usually something else has to decay first. It decays into something that is not stable, which very quickly decays. Uh, by neutron emission or spontaneous fission. Um, don't quote me on that though, all right? Um, we're gonna talk about these different types of decays. Next time we're gonna talk about reactions, which are different from decays. Reactions happen when, a, a, a decay is just a nucleus that just spontaneously does something. A reaction is a nucleus changing because something perturbs it. It's something runs into it, all right? So let's first talk about gamma decay. Gamma decay happens because a nucleus is in some excited state and it gives off energy as a photon to go to a lower energy state. So it's kind of like a hydrogen atom when its electron goes from a higher energy to a lower energy state, it gives off its energy to uh, a photon. It's the same idea, only now it's the nucleons in the nucleus that are changing state, all right? So rather than electrons, it's the stuff actually inside the nucleus. Because nuclear binding energies are much higher than electron binding energies, these photons tend to be much shorter wavelength, much more energetic, and they can be very dangerous. All right, so an example is, here's a carbon-14 atom, maybe some is the result of some nuclear decay. After the decay, it ends up in the excited state, in an excited state. That's what this little asterisk means, is that it's in an excited state. And it can go down to a lower energy state by giving off some of its energy as a photon. And that photon is what we call a gamma ray. All right, so gamma ray is just a photon that comes from a nuclear um, de-excitation. All right, beta decay. It turns out that beta decay is really three types of decay, um, and it involves electrons and positrons getting um, involved in the nucleus. All right, so what is a positron? A positron is an anti-electron. If you've ever heard of antimatter, antimatter is real. Antimatter is like regular matter except different. It's, uh, for example, one difference is an antiparticle has the opposite charge of a particle, all right? So the electron's antiparticle is the positron. It has a positive charge instead of a negative charge, all right? Beta decay changes a proton to a neutron or a neutron to a proton, and it uses electrons and positrons to do that. In beta minus decay, what happens is I have some nucleus, say, for example, a carbon-14 nucleus. It can go to a lower energy state right, more tightly bound, more stable state by getting, changing one of its uh, neutrons into a proton, all right? To change a neutron into a proton, that's adding positive charge, so we have to get rid of some negative charge to make up for that. So um, spontaneously then, uh, a, proto a neutron becomes a proton plus an electron, all right? So we go from carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. The number of nucleons doesn't change because we've just converted one proton to one neutron, right? So we become a new element, but in order to conserve charge, there's several, there's several conservation laws that have to be obeyed. One is charge has to be conserved. So to conserve charge, if I make a new positive charge, I have to make a negative charge here. So I have an electron that comes out as well, all right? And it turns out, I also have to conserve energy. When people were looking at these decays a long time ago, they'd noticed that the electrons did not come out with enough kinetic energy. There was missing energy. So they theorized that there was some other particle being kicked out, and it turned out eventually they found out they were right, that there is another particle that comes out that takes away some of that energy that's known as a neutrino. All right, it turns out neutrinos come in different types, and uh, there's a type of neutrino that is tied to the electron, uh, and it turns out there's one other thing we have to conserve here, and that is what we call lepton number, how much electronness there is. 
So we had no electron, we just made an electron, and we have more electronness. And so we have to emit an electron neutrino, but we make it an anti-electron neutrino. This bar over the top tells me that it's an anti-neutrino. All right, and so this has kind of anti-electronness, and it conserves the electronness, the lepton number uh, of the universe. All right, so beta minus decay is a change a neutron to a proton and spit out an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. All right. Beta plus decay is the same thing except we're going to spit out a positron, an anti-electron. A positron has positive charge, so if we kick out positive charge, what we're doing is we're getting rid of the positive charge of one of our protons. We're turning one of our protons into a neutron. So the number of nucleons will stay the same, but we're changing a proton to a neutron, so our atomic number is going to go down by one. So we're going to go down from 62 to 61, all right? In the process, we kick out a positron. A positron has anti-electronness, and so we have to cancel that out by kicking out an electron neutrino, not an anti-neutrino. Now, a positron is an anti-electron, but I chose to notate that by giving you the charge of it rather than putting the bar over it, but this is an antiparticle, all right? The third type of beta decay is what we call electron capture. Imagine some electron is, you know, there hovering around the nucleus. Um, the uncertainty relationship tells us that it, you can't tell, say, where an electron is in its orbit. It's kind of all over. It's got probability all over. But imagine this electron has some probability of being in the nucleus. Some of its wave function is in the nucleus. So imagine then a proton grabs that electron and turns itself into, the two charges cancel out and it turns it into a neutron. All right? So when with electron capture, I grab an electron, that changes a proton to a neutron. So we go down in atomic number to eight from nine in this case, from a fluorine to oxygen. The number of nuclei, whoops, keep clicking here. The number of nucleons stays the same, but the number of proton goes down by one. Now we had some electronness before. We had, you know, and so in order to conserve lepton number, we have to emit a neutrino when we do that. Um, Anyway, you may be asking yourself, so kind of electron capture is kind of like, sort of like beta minus and reverse, except the neutrinos on this side instead of this side. So you might ask, is there something that's kind of like beta plus decay in reverse? Would, is there such a thing as positron capture? Now, it should be possible, but there aren't, I mean, to do electron capture, we had to have the electron to start with, it had to be hanging around the nucleus, Positrons just aren't that common, right? They show up when we do beta plus decay, but very quickly they tend to find an electron and annihilate each other and turn into two photons, all right? So there's just not an abundance of positrons around, so you just don't see positron capture. But in theory, it should be possible. Okay, the next type of decay is alpha decay. And an alpha particle, it turns out, is just a helium-4 nucleus. And it turns out that helium-4 is a very tightly bound, very stable, low energy nucleus. So if, uh, if you want to lower the energy of a system, it's not a bad idea to make alpha particles, is the basic idea. So this is a common type of decay. So radium-226 decays through alpha decay. So um, uranium, radium-226, when it decays via alpha decay, it spits out an alpha particle, all right? We don't have to have neutrinos here because we're not changing the number of electrons or anything. We're just splitting the nucleus, just spitting a piece of the nucleus out. The helium nucleus has two protons, so our proton number, our atomic number, goes down by two. And it has four um, nucleons, so the number of the atomic mass number goes down by four. And I goofed, I forgot to change this. I don't know what's two, what's two less than radium. This is going to become another element now, depending on whatever that proton number is. All right, neutron emission. Uh, turns out neutron emission is important for fission. We're going to talk about fission next time. But these neutrons flying out of stuff bump into other nuclei, and that's what causes the chain reaction in fission. Also, neutron emissions, it's important to know about them because they can make other things radioactive. So if you have neutron emission going on, you may have some perfectly happy non-radioactive nuclei that become radioactive when they capture or get bumped into by these neutrons. Neutron emission is usually a result of another type of decay happening first. So imagine like an alpha, uh, so, uh, okay, so imagine you have some decay, 
and the nucleus ends up in an excited state after that decay that's not stable and it spits off some uh, spits off some neutrons or potentially it's the result of something bumping into and causing some 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 reaction happening so for example if I have beryllium and helium and they smash together to make carbon-13. Carbon-13 is not very stable, but carbon-12 is, so maybe we'll spit off a neutron and then be left with carbon-12. Alright, so uh, that's the basic idea of neutron emission, you just spit out a neutron. Now, why do some things decay and why do others not? Why are some nuclei stable and some aren't? Well, here is a chart of the nuclei, the nuclides, alright, it's showing the different nuclei. The black dots are ones that are stable, that don't decay. And then you see all the different the colors of ones that beta decay, beta plus, electron capture, beta minus, alpha, uh, proton emission, whatever. All right. Um, and you notice the stable ones sort of almost form a line. So this dotted line right here is what you would get if you had uh, equal numbers of protons and neutrons. And you see the black line, all the black dots that form the, the stable region, they fall kind of along that line and then dripping down below, kind of below uh, that line as you go to bigger and bigger nuclei. So what is the reason for that? Well, the idea is you want your nucleus to be, it, to be stable means it's a low energy state. Things are tightly bound. All right. Now, um, we didn't really talk about the Pauli exclusion principle when we did atoms, but you may have learned about that in some other class. And the basic idea is uh, a Fermi particle, and electrons are Fermi particles, and neutrons and uh, protons are fermions, they cannot occupy the same state. You can't have two of them in the same energy state. So the idea is if I have uh, a proton in some low energy state, and I want to add another proton, it can't go into, the other, into that same state. It's got to go to some other state. So if they add more and more protons, they have to go to higher and higher energy level states, which makes for a less stable particle, a more energetic, less tightly bound particle. All right? But protons and neutrons are different. So a proton and a neutron can share the same energy level. So it makes sense if I want things to be tightly bound, to be low energy, it would make sense to have about equal numbers of protons and neutrons. I start with a proton, I go to add the next particle. If I add a neutron, it can go into that same energy level where if it's a proton, another proton, it has to go into a different state. So if I add about equal numbers, I can get a more tightly bound nucleus. So that's why they tend to be about equal numbers, equal proton and neutron. But then notice as I get up to uh, more massive nuclei, the stability line here drops below, drops towards having extra neutrons. And that's because as I start to add lots of protons, protons repel each other um, due to the electro electromagnetic force due to the Coulomb repulsion, all right? So as I start to get lots of protons, it becomes less energetically favorable to add another proton, even though it could maybe go to a lower energy shell, the energy levels get shifted by the electromagnetic interaction. And so as you get to hot, larger and larger nuclei, it's more favorable to have extra neutrons. And so that's why it curves that way. Then if you zoom in, you'll notice that there's certain numbers that we call magic numbers. That over here you see I've got some stable isotopes, but for 20 I have a whole bunch that have a proton number of 20 and a whole bunch that have a neutron number of 20. That has to do with closing shells. And once again, we didn't talk about this much with atoms, but you may have learned in a chemistry class somewhere that when you close a shell, certain numbers of electrons uh, will result in more tightly bound electrons to the atoms. The same thing happens with nuclei. There's certain magic numbers that close shells which result in more tightly bound nuclei. So for certain numbers, you're going to end up with extra uh, nucleides that have that number of protons or that number of neutrons. Okay, now the last thing I wanted to mention is why is there nuclear stuff in the ground for us to dig up? All right, so... Um, we said that, uh, you know, we did these problems with radium that lasts a few thousand years. Its half-life is a few thousand years. So the Earth is made of uh, stardust, right? Stars exploded, churned up all this, these different elements in the explosion. That coalesced, some of that coalesced together to make the Earth, right? Well, maybe there was some radium in that stuff, and that got pulled gravitationally in, made to be part of the Earth, and so we can dig that radium up. But then you say, well, wait a minute. The Earth has been around for millions of years. 
why is there still radium left? Right? Radium only lasts a few thousand years. There just should be insignificant amounts of it left. Well, it turns out all of the short-lived radioactive stuff in the Earth is the result of longer-lived radioactive stuff, which has decayed to form the lower, uh, shorter-lived stuff. So there are uh, several uh, types of radioactive material that has half-lives of billions of years that is in the Earth, and then they decay to form all the other stuff. So for example, uranium-238, it, it's very long-lived, but it can decay to make other isotopes, all right? And for example, it can do an alpha decay. That reduces its neutron number and its proton number by two. That gives us thorium-234. And it can decay, right? We're, we're keeping the same number of nucleons, right? We're changing a uh, neutron to a proton, right? So that's like beta minus decay, right? And that gets us another nucleon. And we can do another beta minus, get uranium-234. Then we can do another alpha and get alpha and get thorium-230. But the point is, we can, we can create all of these things. There's our radium, right? So it decays as a result of uranium-238 decaying, eventually becoming radium. Um, we can get all the different isotopes of this decay because points along diagonal lines this way are connected by beta plus, beta minus, and electron capture, all right? And then groups of these going over to across and to down, those are connected by alpha decay, right? So there's kind of four series. The ones that start at uranium-238 gets this, 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 and then there's three other groups of things that you get from decays from three other long-lived nuclei. And that's the basic idea. If you want to learn more about the decay chain, go to Wikipedia. Now, um, just a word about radiation. Alpha particles, they're big and they're charged. So that means they interact with things strongly and they have a lot of inertia. So they don't penetrate very well. They will only go through a few centimeters of air. All right. Beta particles are lighter, but they're also charged. They will go through air, but they're blocked by a piece of paper or a sheet of metal. So alpha and beta particles are not the most dangerous radiation out there. Gamma rays, however, very short wavelength light, they pen they'll penetrate several centimeters of lead or a meter of concrete. They easily penetrate the skin and interact with human cells. So gamma rays are a really dangerous type of radiation. Now, an alpha emitter you might think is not very dangerous, but maybe after the alpha emission you end up with a nucleus in an excited state that undergoes gamma decay. So you still have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about the alpha particles as much, but you do have to worry about the fact that gamma radiation may come after that. Another really dangerous thing are neutron emitters. Um, neutrons are often made by other decay types. So maybe, once again, alpha decay happens and then after that a neutron is emitted. Neutrons are very penetrating, all right, so they're dangerous, and they can make other things radioactive. So they can, you know, something that used to be safe now is no longer safe because something else irradiated it with neutrons. Now, what has to be true for a particular type of nuclear decay to happen? Things, conservation laws have to be, con uh, have to be obeyed. Energy must be conserved, momentum must be conserved, angular momentum must be conserved. So if you could look at the rest energies, all right, of what we start with and what we end up with, if we go down in energy, that's okay. We can turn some energy into kinetic energy. But going up in energy is not allowed. That, de that decay won't happen. You also have to conserve things like charge, lepton number, baryon number. Those are things we really haven't talked about. In addition, there needs to be some force that makes it happen, right? Um, electrons do not interact via the nuclear strong force, right? So it turns out the beta decay doesn't happen through the strong force. So there's some other force called the nuclear weak force that makes it happen, which makes beta decay slower than it would be if electrons interacted with the strong force. All right, so um, we're not really studying all of this, but just to give you the idea that nuclear physics is a very rich and interesting field, there's a lot more to learn.